Monday, June 22nd, and this is a meeting of Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Um, we are going to be looking at uh, two bills this morning, really to introduce them. Uh, they're both House bills. They both pass the House, and so they have a, a short path to the governor's desk, we hope, if we uh, move them. Um, the first is H716, an act relating to the Abenaki, uh, Abenaki hunting and fishing licenses. The second is H683, an act relating to the protection of migratory birds. Um, we don't have counsel with us today, and there's actually uh, a longer list of witnesses we'll be assembling for the Abenaki uh, hunting and fishing license bill. Uh, but uh, Commissioner Porters uh, was available to join us this morning. So uh, we don't have counsel, and I think I would just ask uh, Commissioner Porter to, um, however formally or informally, you know, introduce us to the bill and you know why we have it, what the issues are that are folded into it, please. Sure. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Lewis Porter, Commissioner of Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, thanks for the opportunity to join you this morning on both bills. I believe we're starting with the Abenaki license bill, correct? Yes. Um, that great. Is correct. Great. Um, so this is a bill that was introduced in the House. The goal here is to uh, restore hunting and fishing rights uh, licenses to members of, of uh, a variety of, of Native American Indian tribes or bands uh, to provide them with free lifetime hunting and fishing licenses. Um, the department and I are supportive of this bill. I, I think that it it writes and recognizes a, uh, well, it doesn't actually write it. It recognizes a historic injustice uh, and wrong done to, to those who lived in, in, uh, in Vermont before, uh, before European uh, arrival. Uh, and it, it does, it's really a gesture to undo some of that. The, obviously these, the treaties and agreements that were made uh, covered a lot more than hunting and fishing rights. Um, including, uh, well, just a lot, a lot more than hunting and fishing rights. However, this is a, a, a gesture towards undoing at least one of those, uh, one of those wrongs. Uh, we're supportive of it. Uh, I have to say that, that I am ultimately the person who has to balance our budget. Uh, and uh, this is one of a number of unfunded mandates and directives from the legislature that I need to find within my current and declining uh, and declining revenue sources. And so while I'm supportive of the bill and I think it's a good measure to pass, uh, I do think that uh, it, the, the joint fiscal estimate is that this would cause between, uh, I believe it's between a $35,000 and $45,000 annual revenue loss to the department. Some of that in, in annual license, hunting and fishing licenses, some of that in lifetime uh, hunting and fishing license revenue, which we put into a trust fund to pay for future costs. Uh, I actually uh, res respectfully uh, think that the Joint Fiscal Office underestimates that revenue loss pretty substantially. Uh, first of all, because while they, while it's a very difficult thing to estimate and, and they did, uh, they did reach out to us as they were working on their, on their note, fiscal note. Uh, I don't think that it, it adequately takes into account several things. Uh, one of which is, uh, the differential in, in what Vermonters in different parts of the state and from different backgrounds, the rate at which they participate currently in hunting and fishing. Um, and the, the likelihood that this will probably provide an incentive to people to reclaim their, their uh, heritage as a member of one of these bands, which, which is a good thing. But I do think that the, the $35,000 to $45,000 annual revenue loss estimate is, uh, is probably low. Um, but you have the joint fiscal note, and, uh, and you can make your own, your own evaluation of that. I do appreciate Joint Fiscal doing the note and, and also especially appreciate them reaching out to us to discuss it. Uh, that's very helpful in terms of us getting to a good, to a good place. So in the, in the House, there were a couple of different suggestions uh, of, of ways to make up that revenue, um, including uh, withdrawing the annual cost of those licenses from the Attorney General's litigation fund uh, and a suggestion in the House also that the 
um, that the uh, uh, Senator Rogers provision to include a use fee on access areas and wildlife management areas be incorporated into the bill. Uh, neither of those were, were moved um, in the House. There was also an amendment to limit this to Vermont residents who are members of these, of these bands. Um, that was not uh, accepted either. Um, in addition, there was an amendment in the House to expand this to trapping as well as hunting uh, on, the, uh, on the idea that uh, at the time that these rights were, were uh, negotiated or taken away uh, from the Ab Abenaki, uh, trapping was really an extension of hunting and was not a separate activity, not a separate license. So that's where the bill stands. I, we, we are very supportive of it. I do think that in its current form, it, it's essentially an unfunded tax expenditure. Um, and that difference will be made up by the Fish and Wildlife Department in one of two ways. Either we will employ fewer people um, or we will increase hunting and fishing licenses on, on everyone else who holds them to, to make up the difference. Those are really our two options in terms of responding to the, to the lost revenue. Uh, and I do think that some mechanism uh, through which uh, the, the cost would be spread out among all Vermonters as, as uh, all Vermonters uh, uh, have, have uh, I guess I'd say have, have benefited or uh, all, of our, all of our predecessors uh, did these, these uh, injustices um, to, these, to the members of these bands. Uh, I think that that's more, uh, would be appropriate given the given rather than having uh, those who have hunting and fishing licenses cover the additional costs. Um, so that's my short summary of the bill. Happy to answer any questions about it. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you for the introduction, uh, very helpful. The, um, a, a quick question about just the uh, overall implementation. Um, how does one distinguish who is eligible to receive um, the benefits under the proposed bill uh, versus not? I mean, is there already a clearly defined sort of legal mechanism for claiming that heritage and therefore uh, being allowed a free license? Or well, I would I would defer to the to the Commission on Native American uh, Native American Matters, the Vermont Commission. Um, uh, and to Chief Stevens on this, because I, I don't really know the details of the of the uh, tribal uh, uh, membership uh, system. And, and as I understand it, the different bands have different uh, mechanisms through which they they do that. But but on the Fish and Wildlife Department side, somebody would come and present to us a card identifying them as a member. They would present their um, their, uh, you know, driver's license or whatever identification. So we know it's them and they would be eligible for a lifetime hunting and fishing license. Okay, great. Um, and um, can you talk a little bit more about some of the things that were in place? So for instance, uh, limiting it to Vermont residents versus not limiting it to Vermont residents. Do you have a position and can you characterize why what sort of the back and forth was about? Sure, certainly. Uh, so my position on that was to defer to Chief Stevens as the as the primary uh, 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 architect or originator of this idea, and to defer to his uh, to his views and his wishes on this one. Um, I obviously the the historic bands did not uh, did not were not confined within the borders of Vermont, obviously, um, and so I think that there is a good argument to be made for extending that beyond uh, Vermont residents. Uh, Senator, uh, I mean, uh, Representative um, Brennan, who introduced that amendment, I think he felt as though uh, this is qu quite, a, quite a benefit to be giving to people who are not Vermont residents, and that while he supported the bill and supports the concept, he, he felt it was fair to limit that to, to members of the bands who are in fact Vermont residents rather than residents of another of another state or, or province. Okay, thank you. Um, so that's that one. Um, I- How about the, the expanded trapping provision? Yeah, I think, I think that probably makes sense as the, as the, uh, as the uh, 
uh, fact of the matter is there, there wasn't really a distinction historically, as I understand it, in, in trapping and hunting activities. We treat them as a different activity with a different license. Um, uh, but I, I don't think that historically they were viewed that way. And so I think that makes some sense. Uh, the, the fiscal impact to that would be quite small, given the, the small number of, of trapping licenses in the state. Okay. Um, and just for scale, so if, if you were to lose roughly um, $40,000 in license income, uh, how does that compare to what your current total license income is now? Current total license income is, uh, I apologize, don't hold me to the exact amount, but it's somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, $7 million, give or take uh, okay. a million. Um, so it's it's small. Um, our entire budget for the department is is uh, twenty five million dollars, give or take. Um, so it, this is a, a this is a small uh, amount of of revenue hit on a on a large budget. A having said that, you are the legislature is this year considering uh, a ban on animal part importation, which the wardens will enforce with no uh, funding attached to it a migratory bird uh, protection bill with no funding attached to it, a Act 250 expansion, which I'm grateful to this committee and to the House committees for considering a bill back provision on, but that only covers a portion of what we spend on Act 250 and what we will spend to implement that bill. Um, that's just this year. Uh, in addition, we do boating enforcement. We don't have uh, designated funding for. Other regulatory involvement, uh, we don't have funding for. We have agreed in the past to have a reciprocal license on Lake Champlain, which costs us a million dollars a year in lost revenue for the benefit, the economic benefit it provides to the state of Vermont. Um, so I, I don't want to seem like a sound like a whiny commissioner, although I guess that's what I am. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is the the uh, the the mandates and the expectations on the department pile up. Um, right. And we do a lot for the state and we're and we're happy to do it. At the end of the day, I've got to balance. I got to meet. I got to choose what work we do and don't do. The, the other slightly concerning thing, or or not concerning, but the other piece that's worth mentioning about this is, this is state money that can be used to draw down federal money. That means it's particularly important to our, our department because, as a as a small state minimum that gets the that gets the set minimum amount of federal funds we're always struggling to make sure that we draw that federal money down and don't leave it on the table. All right, I'll stop, I'll stop my diatribe to your simple question now, Senator. Thank well, you. Well, no, just, I wanna make sure I understand the mechanics of that last point. So for when you do hunting and fishing licenses, those dollars uniquely pull down federal money? Those dollars and our general fund dollars can be used to pull down federal money. And okay. it's a very advantageous match rate, uh, three federal dollars to every dollar of state money. But there are also a lot of activities within the department that are not eligible for federal funding. So uh, I guess I would say I, I, I'm always concerned that at some point in the future, uh, especially given declining numbers of hunters, that so at some point in the future, we will not be able to draw all of our federal money in. And I think that would be a shame. Yeah. Um, well, you know, so thanks for uh, walking through the, the financial side. Um, it's been this committee's position, I think, pretty steadily over the years that when we ask um, you all to take on some work, whether it's rulemaking or something else, that uh, if it has an impact and it requires resources that will often, I mean, I know we I know we've said many times, if it requires a resource, please tell us what it is, how much it costs. And then it, I think it falls to us to say, if we really want to get this work done, then we need to go ahead and, and fund it. Um, doesn't always, we're not in charge of appropriations. That's our right. challenge. They, they sometimes don't agree with uh, adding work, but not adding money to do the work. Understood. And if I could just respond quickly to that, Senator, I'm sorry, I, I keep uh, delaying Senator Campion's question. No, 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 no. It's, it's, it's more for the chair. You keep going. Sure. Um, I just want to make it clear that even in the absence of funding, we, we are supportive of the bill because we think it's, it's that important. So it, it's not a, it's not a, it's covered somewhere, some other way, or we don't support the bill. So I just want to be clear about that. Thank you. Great. Um, any 
committee questions for. Uh, yeah, I have one for you, uh, Mr. Chair. I suspect this is going to finance and approach, so we're not really going to be that involved with the money piece. Is that accurate? Well, uh, I don't think there's an appropriation involved, but there is a, uh, a uh, tax expenditure in terms of lost revenues, so finance would certainly be interested. But even uh, though it would uh, could impact the budget of the department, it, it would not go to approach? Uh, well, so maybe it also has to stop in and approach, but I'm not, yeah, I just want to get us. I don't want us to get too hung up on the money piece since. No, no, no. I just want us to understand what yeah. we're. Thank you. Proposing. That's all. And, and I believe that on the house side, uh, it went to ways and means for sure. And I think it only had a drive by in, in a probes. I don't think they formally took it into to appropriations. Okay. Um, so there are uh, uh, sort of, you know, based on that concept of nothing in our name without us there, uh, you know, we will be inviting members of uh, different bands to join us in a, we'll spend some time uh, looking and we'll come back to this uh, tomorrow. But we, uh, given that we were really all on short notice, uh, we, we couldn't assemble all the witnesses, so I really picked uh, a appreciate the commissioner jumping right in to help us launch the discussion. Um, Senator Rogers. Yeah, so uh, just briefly um, to some of the commissioner's points, I agree with him that JFO probably underestimated it. Um, I know our family has Native American ancestry as do a lot of the folks especially in this area where uh french canadians and um many native americans uh joined families um so i think that could be underestimated uh i do support it wholeheartedly um i wish trapping was part of it i'm guessing that at this late time we're probably trying not to make any changes to it but trapping, I feel, should be part of it. And I would really like to see the access language attached to it to try to help make up with the lost revenue. So if that's something we don't get to this year, I hope that the legislature will look at both of those issues next year. Thank you. Uh, I think you're right. You know, although those are ideas that in an ordinary time and the schedule, we would slow down, bear down, look at it, think about moving it. Yeah. Right now, we're we are so short on time that um, it's harder to do that. Uh, Senator McDonald. Okay. Um, all right. So if there are not any more questions for the commissioner, we're going to um, shift gears and uh, move on to uh, H683, an act relating to the protection of migratory birds. Um, and uh, I'm just looking in the room to see uh, who all our guests are at the moment. Um, we don't have um, our own council here at the moment, but we do have a uh, lead sponsor. So I Representative Dolan, do you want to, uh, introduce the bill to the committee. You know, our, the short form of our question is, what opportunities or problems do you see and how's the bill address them? And she's remarkably still on my screen. All right, she may have stepped away from her do so. computer. Let's give it another few Can seconds. you all hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. And thank you for this opportunity. I was not expecting to speak. I was expecting to listen in, but I'm happy to, to um, offer my perspective on this bill. Uh, as you know, the we've had in place a 100-year-old-plus migratory bird treaty with our neighboring countries and, and the islands in the Caribbean. And, uh, and we've recognized over that period of time, how important it is for the health of our ecosystems and our forests of having that treaty. It doesn't address this, this bill and that particular treaty is about the non-game species and that's what the bill focuses on, the non-games of birds that migrate. 
and they, as you know, um, bring the music to our forests during the our summer months. And uh, and yet, what we've learned is that over the course of the last forty years or so, when we've been um, fortunate to have researchers evaluating the health of these bird populations and the engagement of bird watchers around the 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 country is that bird populations and their numbers and their richness by species have actually going in the wrong direction. They're, they're declining. And this bill was brought to our attention by the Audubon Vermont chapter in recognition of uh, steps that we actually can do that can be um, low cost. It, it respects the role of the Fish and Wildlife Department in offering discretion for the department in using its, its resources to protect these birds. And so uh, we had worked through it in our committee. It was voted out, um, if not unanimously, pretty darn close. I think it might've been 10 to one. And I think we got, it received huge support on the house floor. I think over 130 votes for this bill. And again, our focus was really um, to acknowledge the importance of it. Unfortunately, at the federal level, the, um, there were some recent changes to interpreting some of the, the rules that go along with uh, compliance with that, that uh, treaty. And those rules, unfortunately, had eliminated or, or weakened the, um, the recognition of how important habitat is in trying to protect these birds. <clears throat> and so this was a response of that, of that recent change or of the interpretation of those rules that I think took place in 2018 or so to uh, recognize that Vermont, in, in particular, Vermont's forest bird species are, um, Vermont is in a very important location within that Atlantic flyway in particular for our forest species. <clears throat> so this in our mind, was an important step forward to do something for our birds. And the exciting element to this bill is that it did receive support from both the, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, as well as some of the stakeholders. I think Warren Coleman may be here and we had talked with Warren, uh, with VAP, uh, VAPTA and the um, Green Mountain Power and there was strong support for a bill like this. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, any uh, um, committee questions for Representative Dolan? All right. Um, well, with that, then I think I'd like to go next to um, Mr. Mears. David Mears, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, nice to see you again virtually. Um, could you talk to us about the, the bill, the need for the bill, what the feds used to do versus what they're not doing now and how Vermont might play a role in uh, filling in that opened gap? Uh, yes, thank, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. This is the, the first time uh, participating in uh, a committee hearing in this format. So forgive me if I, if I fumble it. Um, I, oh, Hope I shared with Jude a, a fact sheet and a little bit of background so that I, I'll, I'll give you the quick overview. But if, if you have more questions, uh, hopefully you can um, you can get more information through the, the handout that I shared with her. Um, okay. But essentially, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act is a, over 100 years old. It was passed in 1918, and it has been used uh, uh, as a way of providing protections for migratory birds uh, for that entire time. And for the last 50 or so plus years, it has uh, primarily uh, um, been applied by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the con well, it applies in two different kinds of ways for the last 50 or so years. One is it's illegal to actually intentionally kill a migratory bird unless you're doing so, you know, according to uh, state game laws. Um, and uh, that, that has had a dramatic effect for a whole bunch of different birds, which were hunted for their feathers or for food, you know, um, early in the 20th century. And a lot of bird populations that had plummeted have recovered since. Uh, starting about the 1970 or so under the Nixon administration, 
Another set of issues uh, came to the fore, which are where there were actions, typically industrial actions that were taking, that had the effect of dramatically uh, impacting bird populations, but were not necessarily intended to, to cause the bird deaths. That is, un unlike say, you know, shooting a bird with a gun um, or trapping a bird, uh, these deaths were caused by activities such as the um, oil drilling uh, ponds that were associated with uh, drilling well operations and waterfowl would fly over and see them and think they were ponds and, and die because of the contaminants in them. And so since the 70s, those types of activities have also been subject to um, this restriction on taking the migratory birds because um, it's, you know, where, where it's clear that there's going to be a significant impact, but there's no, um, even if there's no intent, that's not an excuse under the law. At least it wasn't until 2017. And then um, the in Secretary of Interior and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service issued a new interpretation, which they said that um, they would only enforce where there was actually uh, an intentional taking of a bird that left a pretty substantial gap across most states in the country, including Vermont, because most states had relied heavily on the Migratory Bird Treaty Act for the authority and relied on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to administer the uh, set of uh, best practices that are typically applied by industry to comply with the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. So this bill is intended simply to return us to the status quo, to, to what it, to the state of the laws existed in Vermont prior to 2017 by uh, giving the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife the authority to prevent um, act actions that are known to cause significant impacts on bird populations. And uh, and respond to that, and uh, so that's that's really the crux of this bill. Um, there were some as as we brainstormed and discussed this bill between the, the Vermont Department of Fish and Wildlife, which has been a great partner in in this advancing this. We talked about a variety of approaches and ultimately decided that having the basic prohibition in place was sufficient. That we didn't need to create a whole new regulatory and permitting program to advance this the goals that in Vermont, we hadn't seen uh, a lot of the kind of industrial activity in the West and Midwest. And most of the activities that were having or had potential impacts on birds were easily resolved when folks like um, the wardens or uh, someone on Lewis's team is able to intervene, have a conversation with the, the actor to make sure they resolve it. And I'll give one example of something that might happen in Vermont frequently, which is if a local community wants to say repaint a bridge um, uh, off, very often there are significant bird populations that nest along bridges, cliff swallows often do. And uh, the, what the, under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and under what this law, this new law would do, it would essentially say, you're still allowed to do maintenance on your bridge. You can clean it, paint it, sand it, whatever you have to do, but wait until the chimney swifts have completed their nesting season. Uh, and do it later in the summer. So it's, it's typically the kind of thing that the, the department is able to work out relatively easily with um, people who have, um, have the, you know, are, are engaged in activities that could have an impact. So it's a relatively simple bill that returns the state to the basic status quo. And um, I'll just leave it at that and happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you. Um, that's very helpful. So uh, just as an, you were mentioning, uh, uh, I would, you anticipated my question, which was, so what's a real world example of how this might happen in Vermont since we don't have big ponds uh, uh, next to oil rigs and all that stuff. Um, uh, so has the federal government, did, has the federal government been reaching out for instance to VTRANS and saying on your bridge schedule, please, uh, you know, at this bridge X or Y, don't paint until after August 1st, or who's been basically enforcing in Vermont thus far? Uh, I think uh, Lewis, uh, Commissioner Porter may be able to speak to this more directly, but uh, in general, it's the, the primary enforcer is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And the primary way in which it's had an effect is actually not been through enforcement. It's been through the issuance of a set of best practices that, for instance, the utility companies with utility lines um, or uh, you know, transportation entities like VTRANS simply comply with as best practice because they know that that's the way that they can avoid getting into an enforcement situation. 
Um, but I do, I do have the sense that in the past that the department staff have also been called on to kind of help people sort through the guidance. Okay. Um, well, thanks. That is very uh, helpful. Any questions, committee questions for Mr. Mears? All right, thank you. I think I'd like to go back to Commissioner Porter and, and ask, so uh, just so we understand like the legal lay of the land here, um, uh, you know, when we talk about emissions, Vermont has, has been delegated that authority. Are you delegated authority by the Federal Fish and Wildlife uh, de Department, you know, to, to carry out federal regulations on their behalf in Vermont? Not as a blanket. Um, so we do have instances where we are, where our wardens are effectively deputized to enforce federal laws and where the, the federal wardens are deputized to enforce Vermont laws. Um, it, it's on a case by case kind of basis, not as a blanket. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so for instance, in the case of like this bridge painting issue, um, how has it, how has it been playing out in Vermont in the last decade or whatever? Yeah, so that th this this is where it gets gets interesting. Um, the the uh, there's not been an, a migratory bird treaty act case in Vermont, to my knowledge. Um, if if there if there was one, it was some it was an obscure case that, that we don't know about and can't uh, can't dig up. But that doesn't mean that the that the act has not had an, an effect in Vermont because probably as as uh, as David Mears says, probably the the greatest effect of this law is in is in uh, encouraging people to to use best practices and to take care in these in these instances. Certainly, in other states, uh, we are already seeing uh, some of that care not be taken as much um, uh, because of the reinterpretation by the Fed, by the feds. Okay. By far, in, in our opinion, by far the best approach. Uh, to protect birds is to have it done at the federal level. And uh, I think that the inter new interpretation of the MB uh, MBTA by, uh, by, the, by the federal government is, is terrible and, and a terrible mistake. And I look forward to uh, another administration or maybe congressional action to, to reverse that because obviously birds are not something we can manage in one state or even a few states. <laughs> Uh, by the very nature of the fact that they're migratory. Right. Having said that, uh, we're supportive of this bill because it, as, a, as, a, uh, as a, a, a partial measure, as a way to both send a message about the importance of, of protection and enforcement of these species, and in the, in the event, uh, however unlikely that there was something that fit this, uh, this bill's category uh, and was done uh, you know, with, with the ability to foresee that it would cause a significant number of bird deaths and somebody went ahead and did it anyway, we may very well enforce on that. Uh, so I do think that the bill is helpful um, and, and important. Um, I, I, do, uh, I do hope that the, that the federal uh, interpretation, the federal regu uh, regulatory agency goes back to, their, to the old way of, of managing this because I think it was pretty effective and pretty reasonable. When you take something like the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and move it from federal law into state law, you can't just take the language and put it into state law because the expectations and the abilities and the and the uh, and the requirements on on us as a state agency are quite different than at the federal level. And and what I mean by that is, you know, people expect that when there's a, a wildlife incident, even though even a one even a one uh, one member, one one individual wildlife incident, they expect that the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department will be responsive to that. Uh, that's not so true for the for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They're expected by citizens to be to 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 take on matters that, that are that are bigger and more significant to population levels. That's a long preamble way of saying that I'm grateful to Audubon and to the House for taking the time to work on this bill and not not just move the federal language to the state language, to the state statutes, but to actually craft a law that, that is um, tailored and, and appropriate to us, to a state agency. And, and I think that's been done here. Um, I, I, I mentioned the, the uh, and, and 
like as I say, I think the enforcement of this bill will probably be quite small in terms of resources. And I, but I mentioned the the uh, mandates and 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 issues there on the on the prior bill, and I just I won't go into all of that again. Um, I would uh, suggest that that there are two uh, changes to this bill that that would make it a better and and stronger bill or or a better bill. Um, that and and I apologize. Uh, uh, the whole world's changed several times since the last time I looked at this bill uh, in in uh, before before COVID. Um, but one suggestion that we would have is uh, in uh, let's see in uh, in the uh, four nine zero two on page four of the bill. Um, uh, we would suggest that uh, that the species protected by the Migratory Bird Treaty Act be listed here instead of this blanket. And, and the reason for that is that there are a number of species that, that are potentially invasive that I don't think we want to protect in this bill. And uh, among them, European starlings, house sparrows, pigeons are already, are already excluded here, uh, mute swans and others. So I, I, I think that, that without weakening the bill, you could, you could list those species just reference to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act and list those species protected under that act, um, and and uh, not not interfere with with uh, USDA Wildlife Services or others' attempts to manage these potentially invasive species. Okay. Um, the so, other, sorry, go ahead. Well, quick question on that. So, at the federal level, has anyone called out the the invasive species and say we ex we've excluded them from management, or is this just wondering? I if think I think because of the potential for invasive species to invade, the the better way to do it would be to list those species included in the MBTA. Okay. Um, and and possibly with with some kind of updater provision in case additional species are covered by it. But that's a double-edged sword in my mind because the the it is possible the feds could for some reason remove certain species from that list and you and you wouldn't want to update it for the removal you'd only want to update it for the additions if, if that makes sense so maybe the cleanest way to do it would be to just reference the current today MBTA uh, protected species. Okay, and is that and, that, and we that can list? draft something. Okay, I was going to say does this list exist somewhere already okay yeah great. absolutely and, and and we can draft something that would that would help out there and okay. i i apologize because i really don't want to bog this bill down with changes i know you have very limited time left here but i i don't think that that would uh create a consternation among either the supporters or the regulated industry um to make that change okay. uh david, I, david are you in agreement with that david mears Yes, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a good change. Thank you. Seems to make sense. Okay. You're batting a hey. thousand so far, Mr. Ford. <laughs> uh, the other, for the other proposed change or potential change, uh, I would turn it over to Catherine Guessing, our attorney. But in essence, I think the enforcement uh, section that's listed here, uh, 4520 in the second to last line of the bill, um, I think that. Uh, there may be a better enforcement section to reference there, and, and we can give you a suggestion on that uh, offline as well. Okay, great. Um, and, I, and if you have questions, I would, I would ask you to, to I would direct those to Catherine, as she uh, is obviously more knowledgeable on this than I am. By, by sure. Her. Well, I see you have a team here, Mr. Scott's with us, as well as Ms. Guessing. So, Ms. Guessing, good morning. Thanks. You want to fill us in on the enforcement piece? Good morning. Um, Let's see. So on page five under um, 4910, um, it runs, well, there's a, the last sentence says, enforcement of this provision shall be in accordance with 10 VSA section 4520. And that is a section which allows the agency to bring civil actions before the um, the Superior Court. Uh -huh. um, there are a number of provisions um, in the current statutes that relate to that. So 4518, 4519, 4520. I think it's there's a 4520A. Actually, not 4518, but 
Um, one of the suggestions that, one of the things that could be done is to just cross off that last part. Um, if um, under our statutes, um, there's a catch-all so that would allow us to bring an action for a thousand dollars per bird. Um, if we cross off that provision, we still would be able to use provision if the circumstances warranted it. Um, it's a civil action. The other one is basically a ticket um, for up to a thousand dollars, and it also does not preclude us from collecting restitution. Um, for non-game species, um, you know, things that aren't turkeys or things that normally get hunted, um, that would be a pretty nominal amount. Um, and, and sorry. The, well, just so we understand better, I think from a legal standpoint, are you saying that the, the catch-all thousand dollars a bird provision is a a more workable provision than using a civil action at superior court? It's just a preferred way of enforcing? It, it could very well be. This would just give us some flexibility. Um, you know, if we had kind of a really egregious um, sort of matter, it might be well worth taking it to, um, you know, to superior court. Okay. Um, so this but, is either or, this is uh, more choices. It's, it's essentially gives us a little bit more flexibility to use the, um, the enforcement provisions that already exist in the statutes. Okay, so, so, uh, just, so pardon me, go ahead. Um, that, what, what that would mean is that we could use 4515, which is a ticket for no more than $1,000, and typically what we do is we work with the Judicial Bureau to you know, figure out what a, a fair waiver um, fine is for that. Um, then there's um, under 4519 and 4520, that's the, that's the piece that um, allows us to bring a civil action in, in Superior Court. And basically um, we can assess civil penalties not to exceed a thousand dollars for each violation. So if there were a whole number of birds, um, we could bring, you know, we could ask for a thousand dollars per bird, right. um, not to exceed twenty-five thousand dollars under the statutory provisions. And then there's also a um, section that deals with restitution, which would only be applicable to um, the the 4515 general penalty. And that would be, you know, if it's not a big game species, it would be no more than $500 and no less than $50 for each bird. Okay. So I, I'm just suggesting that just citing that one statutory section is a little too narrow. Yep. And um, it does make it harder to just issue a ticket. Um, it also doesn't you know, there's some ambiguity about whether or not we would be able to use the settlement provisions that are related to the 4520. So, um, if you could, um, it would be a very simple um, change, which would just delete that last sentence. Right. Great. So, as you know, what it's like around the home stretch time, if you can draft language for the two changes you're proposing. Um, and send them to the committee, uh, including our counsel for this. Oh, is this, uh, I think Ellen Chikowski did the drafting. Is that correct? Um, or, correct. Okay. Um, and um, so, so if you would send them to the committee and to Ms. Chikowski as well, that would be helpful and keep us moving along. But let me also pause and make sure since this represented uh, you know, a balance between different points of view to um, the second proposed amendment is, um, Mr. Mears, are you supportive of that change? Yes, I, I, I absolutely support mm -hmm. I, I was just uh, thinking that I, I actually, I think some of this got lost in the last minute shuffle in the house, which I'm sure you will appreciate. These were changes sure. we had agreed to already. So I'm, I'm glad that you are uh, open to, to considering them. Okay. Uh, Senator Rogers, I see you have an assistant with you. 
Uh, who's your assistant? This is my granddaughter, Aria. <laughs> um, wait to everybody and say hi. She's a pretty Aria. good one. <laughs> um, her apple. Yes, very peaceful. Um, so, uh, and Commissioner Porter, you have a, on your team that you're here, uh, Mr. Scott's here today. I don't know if you wanted him to weigh in on anything we've talked about so far. He, he just texted me to say he's fine not testifying unless you have questions for him. Okay, great. Well, then um, I would go on the sort of the last uh, sort of group of interested parties we haven't heard from yet are uh, represented by Mr. Coleman. So Mr. Coleman, if you could fill us in on who you're on whose behalf you're uh, speaking and then talk to us about the bill and the proposed amendments too, please. Okay, good, good morning. Um, I'm not here on behalf of the uh, Vermont Trails Alliance. I'm here on behalf of uh, Velco and uh, Green Mountain Power this morning. Um, and I testified in the House uh, in support of the, uh, the bill and worked closely with, uh, with uh, David Mears and, uh, uh, and the commissioner on this. And uh, just right at the outset, uh, I support the two changes that, that the uh, commissioner and uh, Ms. Guessing have outlined for you. Um, so I think those would be improvements to uh, improvements to the bill. Um, I thought what I would do just very, very briefly is just sort of explain uh, why the utilities were part of the discussion and, 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 and sort of how what, what role we play in, in this. Um, and I think it was already touched on before by, uh, uh, by David in talking about best management practices. So for example, um, Velco, as you know, which has the uh, you know transmission line system uh, in the state of Vermont, they have uh, a pretty comprehensive vegetation vegetation management uh, program that is approved by the Agency of Natural Resources with a strong emphasis on making sure that their their practices uh, and maintaining that vegetation are compatible uh, with 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 all bird species, migratory birds included. So, for example. Uh, a lot of it has to do with you know the timing of practices so making sure that you're doing those vegetation management practices uh, at a time when nesting has already uh, nesting has already occurred um, they've also been worked in numerous situations in partnership with the state and federal government uh, if you've ever been in the conti wildlife refuge there are woodcock singing grounds there that are for uh, you know woodcock um, uh, mating and uh, and nesting um, on the other side, uh, Green Mountain Power, as you know, uh, um, has uh, a, a wind project up in, uh, up in Lowell. Um, some of the practices that they've engaged in to make sure that they are not having in, any impacts on migratory species, but in particular, t &E species involve the curtailment of how that facility is operated during certain weather conditions when species are known to be moving about and migrating, uh, as well as, um, Having a T and E permit uh, that um, requires those uh, those certain types of operations, as well as uh, requirements to contribute to a mitigation fund for uh, for habitat. And we're talking about bats uh, bats in, in that particular case. So I just want to give you just two quick examples um, where where it is working, where the state has not needed to come in and do you know any type of enforcement. We've been partners working with the state and with the uh, with the feds on this. And so that was uh, that just, again, sort of background to understand one of the regulated industries that, in, that could be impacted by, by, uh, by this and ultimately to say we're fine with the, with the, uh, with the legislation as, it, as it's come out of the house, provided you make those additional two changes, I think those would be, be helpful. My connection wasn't quite perfect. Um, did you say the species of concern up at Lowell was bats? It was. It was initially, I think, migratory birds and bats. Teeny, teeny species. Uh, a recent renewal of the teeny permit actually only lists bats because the monitoring period over the past, and I don't know how many years that it's been, has shown that there's not been any uh, impacts on uh, on birds. So they didn't feel that it that that needed to be actually part part of the permit going forward. So I think it's shown that. Uh, it's it's operating uh, as as hoped, and the curtailment practices are up are, are working. I don't sure. know if you know if, if the commissioner has anything to add, but that would be my interpretation of that. Sure. Well, just so we um, 
one you don't have to know this, but it'd be interesting. When, how often is it curtailed and under what kind of events? Is there a bat migration season or something? And so that's when they curtail? I'd, I'd have to go back and look, but there is a sort of a time of season. I think it's certain weather, uh, weather related conditions. And I, I just can't remember what they are off the, off the top of my head. But I can, I can find out and let you know for make good dinner conversation, I, I suppose. Exactly. Not, I, I can give you a little bit of um, background. Um, you know, bats generally are out and forage um, starting in the spring through the fall. So um, I can't remember the exact dates, but it's a uh, you know in May through September um, during you know sort of they start in the evening hours and uh, forage at night, and so. Curtailment generally happens during that time period, and it also happens when the wind speeds are very low, right. because that's a time when bats tend to, for whatever reason, um, come into contact with the um, wind turbines. Um, I think their sonar has some impact on why they are either attracted to the, to the movement and are not able to kind of detect and avoid it at low speeds. So um, that's when curtailment happens. And we've um, found that the protocols around the curt curtailment have been um, pretty successful in mitigating any potential impacts to bats. And um, so that's that's why it's it's a condition that's included in our T E permits. Great. Well, thank you very much for the extra info. Inquiring minds want to know. All right. So with that, uh, are there other, so I think we've covered, uh, we made our room, a, a lap around the room here. Anyone else on the committee or anyone else on the meeting want to offer something on this uh, bill? Okay. So we'll watch for changes coming over to Ledge Council uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, course be meeting again we'll bring that language forward and then um, tomorrow it's always a little troubling to schedule on Tuesdays because we never know how long the floor is going to go so it may be that it's actually Tuesday Wednesday before we get to the finish line on these things but we will be coming back to the migratory bird bill and we'll come back to uh, and have a, a full witness list on the Abenaki um, uh, fishing and hunting bill so with that, we have actually completed our business for the morning. I really appreciate people coming in on a Monday uh, this time of year. Just even a little extra time helps the gears keep turning much more smoothly. So thank you, everybody. Uh, if there's nothing else, we are adjourned.